All right, so uh, just a very brief, uh, a very brief a couple of words about the title slides. Um, this is a newly born white dwarf in the center of this picture, a little white dot that has just shed its outer layers. And uh, if astrophysics is famous for its misnomers, and this is another one uh, where we have stuck to a designation that dates back to late 1700s because uh, these objects look like uh, marginally resolved uh, planetary disks in the very, very early telescopes. So this has nothing to do with planets, the, uh, even though this is called a planetary nebula, it's uh, uh, outer layers of the stars expanding now at 20 to 40 um, <clears throat> kilometers per second. Anyway. Before I uh, get started on my talk, I just want to say a couple of words um, that this is a very unusual talk for me to give um, because I have spent uh, the vast majority of my time in the last 10 years thinking about completely different topics. I've mostly worked on extragalactic astrophysics uh, and especially in the um, uh, on observational studies of quasi feedback where my group has been developing sort of some of the key methods that are used to studying um, the multi-phase quasar winds uh, propagating throughout galaxies. Um, but in the last few years, I have been increasingly more interested in galactic astrophysics, especially in stellar binaries um, at all stages. Um, I have been very lucky to work with a group of uh, brilliant students, and we have written a bunch of papers here and there on all these various topics, but today, I will talk about specifically white dwarfs and white dwarf binaries. And these are the papers that we have written with Chan Chi Kuang, who is now a postdoc here at the Institute, and Vedan Chandra, who is a graduate student at Harvard. Um, and I hope they will be able to help me to uh, answer the most difficult questions that you guys are going to ask me um, on these topics. So, um, uh, with that, you know, I also should emphasize that I'm not an expert. You can see that we've literally been thinking about these issues just for the last couple of years. So please bear that in mind. I just wanted to um, try to give you a feeling for why we got so interested in these issues and uh, what I am very excited about in this era of modern survey surveys and uh, uh, what we're trying to do. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, I will give you a very, very broad um, introduction as to what are some of the interesting topics and what are some of the interesting data sets that we're thinking about. And I will talk about um, three projects that we have done. Uh, one is how we learned to measure white dwarf spectra. Then um, the first application we did of uh, measuring the white dwarf equation of state. And then I will spend um, the bulk of my talk um, trying to give you a sense for what's going on with the search for white dwarf binaries and how that relates to the search for the progenitors of type 1a supernovae. I was also going to say a few words about the uh, mass loss during um, uh, late stages of stellar evolution, but I am not actually going to get into that. So, um, all right, so a like, really big step back um, uh, um, here. Uh, a few years ago, we got extremely excited about thinking about ultra compact binaries of compact stellar remnants. And this is a very exciting and relatively old topic. At least three Nobel Prizes have been given uh, for uh, related sources well before the LIGO discovery of gravitational wave, uh, gravitational waves from mergers, there was the discovery of um, a binary pulsar by Holson Taylor that has been steadily doing its work of decaying orbitally due to the gravitational wave emission, which is what's shown here on the right hand side. Um, you know, now mapped to exquisitely over many years in excellent agreement with the general relativity. Um, in 2011, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. That was a discovery made using type 1a supernovae, which are quite plausibly binaries of white dwarfs emerging due to gravitational waves. And uh, of course, you all know that LIGO discovered gravitational waves from binary black hole mergers and now neutron star mergers. And so what all of those things have in common is that all of these uh, very exciting things are powered by ultra compact binaries of uh, compact remnants, black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. Um, these uh, ultra compact binaries are shrinking due to gravitational wave emission. 
this uh, right hand side is snapshot the bunch of snapshots from the LIGO simulations of black hole black hole mergers. So the first stage is in spiral, then coalescence, and then the ring down. And uh, when the two objects are far enough apart, the in spiral is very well described by this linear theory for which the equation is um, given on the left. So the uh, energy, the, the rate at which the binary is losing its energy is on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Um, you can see actually a very steep dependence on the semi major axis. That's important. Um, so this is uh, the emitted power in gravitational waves, and M1 and M2 are the uh, are the two masses. So what if you want to calculate the time to decay from a fixed initial semi major axis down to a equal to zero, and you want to require this time to be something reasonable, so that you can see these objects evolve over the course of the lifetime of the universe and get to zero and merge. What you find is that A, the semi-major axis, must be smaller than R, the radius of the stars before they became remnants. And so that causes a major astrophysical puzzle, uh, which is basically saying that uh, most of ultra-compact binaries of remnants, like with neutron stars and black holes, must have gone through something called a common envelope phase to kind of pre-shrink their orbits. So they were big, fluffy stars. And in order to get down to that um, maximal A semi-major axis that can shrink to zero over the life, lifetime of the universe, they have must have gone through this phase. This is not 100% true of the most massive black hole, black hole binaries. There are some models which can just barely do this without a uh, common envelope, but more often than not, uh, all, of these, uh, all of these processes will involve the common envelope phase. If you read these papers, you will see a lot of plots like the one shown on the right, where you start with stars one and two, and star one evolves to, say, a red giant phase, and it literally encompasses both stars in the common envelope, so now you have two cores within the common envelope. So now magic happens, and somehow, miraculously, using this alpha parameter that nature loves so much in various contexts, the binding energy of the, the, decaying, uh, the decaying orbital energy of the star gets coupled to the energy of the envelope, ejects, uh, ejects the envelope. So this is a major ingredient in every stellar binary evolution model. Uh, these models are also used in modeling the population of LIGO events. This is very much a black box. There's a huge interest in, um, uh, in this topic as shown. This is a paper mentioning common envelope as a function of time. Um, but the statistics are that um, there are five merger remnants uh, in our own galaxy that kind of happened during the lifetime of modern observations. And only one of them, the 1309 SCO object, was actually observed to have been a binary and then shrank to, to whatever processes it shrank to and then um, entered into the common envelope event. And for this object, we don't even know if it's gonna result in an optocompact binary or not. It wasn't quite, a, it, was a, a, it was a post main sequence object, but not yet a red giant. So this is a, uh, this is a very interesting problem that uh, people are studying observationally and theoretically. We're also interested in this and thinking about various ways to uh, probe this and find the progenitors of common envelope events and whatever. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, another major astrophysical puzzle is what are the progenitors of type 1a supernovae? So type 1a's originally were classified based on their spectroscopic properties, but then it was discovered um, that they have this very well-behaved family of light curves um, they're not quite standard candles, but they are very well standardizable candles. So the brighter ones are decaying more slowly. And so it's a one parameter family. So if you scale the light curves by sort of their, their typical duration, you can predict what their absolute magnitude is. And that's what's shown on the bottom plot. And this is called the Phillips relation. So this has been a a uh, big question for many, many decades now, what are the progenitors of these objects? So um, they behave very well, but it is not clear what explodes, when explodes, how explodes, why it explodes. Um, and so the pendulum has swung back and forth. Uh, there is a really, uh, really interesting review of NEOS at all in annual reviews in 2014 that sort of summarizes a gigantic laundry list of pros and cons for all scenarios. 
But right now, it seems that um, the community is thinking more and more that these are due to a double degenerate scenario where two white dwarfs somehow result, uh, result in this effect. So I, I am not an expert, but I did ask an expert, Ben Shappi, and he said that he was willing to bet his car that 90% are due to double degenerates and 10% single degenerates. Then he thought about it and he said, it's a really old car. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know what to make of that, uh, but that's the confidence limit on this, uh, <laughs> on this statement. Um, the, another important thing to keep in mind is that these objects, if they are due to double degenerate scenario, must have gone through the common envelope. And then actually, uh, probably two. And that is illustrated here. So if you have a one solar mass, one solar mass binary, and you calculate, you invert this equation to calculate the gravitational lifetime um, as a function of the initial orbital period. So in order to um, get them down to zero, what you're looking for is um, binaries in sort of this regime. So from one to 10 hours, and this is a sort of number that I need you um, to keep in mind. And another important thing to keep in mind is that this is an, because of the very steep dependence of the um, gravitational wave emission on the semi-major axis, this is very much an accelerated process. So you might start with a large number of binaries in this regime, and as they evolve, you will end up with very few binaries in this regime because they just whoosh right past um, these separations. So that's just to keep in mind. So if type 1As are due to double degenerate scenarios, so to white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, well then where are these binaries? Do we see enough of them? Um, do they match the re requisite um, a requirement, the requirements for type 1As? So uh, with this very sort of broad introduction into this topic, I um, can tell you this is a really exciting time for galactic and stellar astronomy. And in the last five years, things have really changed dramatically. Um, so Gaia, as you know, not only provides distances to stars um, using parallaxes, but also velocities from proper motions um, that enables a whole range of new techniques, including kinematic aging, uh, kinematic aging technique, which um, Shanti uh, was instrumental in developing because populations get stirred up as they age, stellar populations get stirred up as they age, so high velocity dispersions are older, so this is an important um, new way of um, uh, measuring ages of um, things in the galaxy. Uh, but Gaia also has very high quality photometry and they will release their light curves in just a few months, so that's going to be nuts. Um, so in addition, there, is, um, there are ground-based and space-based galactic variability surveys, so we're taking advantage of all of those data sets. Um, the quality is fantastic, but uh, furthermore, there are now galactic spectroscopic surveys of unprecedented size. LAMOS just released 10 million um, spectra of stars, and Sloan 5 is aiming to obtain over 4 million uh, spectra of stars, including 200,000 white dwarfs. So I will be focusing, the stuff that I'm talking about today is largely coming from Gaia and SDSS. Um, this is the projected coverage of SDSS-5 in the, the Milky Way. So this is superimposed on the map, map of the Milky Way. So this is the uh, bulge in the center of the galaxy. This is the position of the sun. And this was what was covered by the data release 16 um, in terms of spatial coverage. And this is the plan for the Milky Way mapper that will obtain uh, over 4 million spectra of um, stars. It's a little misleading for white dwarfs because white dwarfs are much fainter than main sequence stars and um, giants. And so for white dwarfs, we're definitely not aiming to obtain <laughs> spectra of white dwarfs kiloparsecs away. So the white dwarf volume is a much, much, much smaller circle over here. Um, but um, so let me give you a very quick update on Sloan. I, um, my career is very strongly tied to Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I was a graduate student in Sloan 1. It's my very first project when it came to graduate school and started working with Michael 20 years ago. 
Um, and I have been in and out of Sloan ever since. Um, so Sloan is a, now in its fifth uh, generation. It started taking data in November 2020. We currently have nine months worth of data that we're analyzing. Um, and um, as of a few months ago, it stopped operating to commission robotic fiber positioning systems. So for those of you who remember Sloan Blades, the Blade Survey is over forever. Um, so I have a Blade for sentimental reasons in my office, um, but that's it. There will be no more, uh, no more spectroscopic Blades. Um, so every generation of Sloan makes up their own rules um, based on the science that they want to do as to what kind of objects they want to observe for follow-up spectroscopy. So the Milky Way mapper part of the Sloan 5 is the survey that will be obtaining all of these, uh, uh, all these millions of spectra. And to give you a sense, so 200,000 white dwarfs is about an order of magnitude increase in the total number of spectra of white dwarfs ever observed, period. So the stuff that um, I'm talking about um, today was sort of based on a few thousand white dwarf spectra. So um, you know, again, depending on the signal to noise cut, roughly Sloan 5 will produce an order of magnitude increase in the total amount of data. Okay, so the spectra are taken in 15 minute chunks. And so if you have a binary that is rotating with an hour orbital period, you should literally be able to see variations from one spectral exposure to another. And this is a, not a new method. This was a method actually developed here by Carlos Bodenis and Robert Lupton and collaborators uh, when I was a postdoc. So I remember that very well, that was very exciting. Uh, and now this is sort of a standard part of the way that we do the survey. Okay, so, so really uh, uh, just uh, quickly, um, if we have a binary of normal stars, right? They, um, if one is approaching, one is receding, you have these two well-separated absorption lines that are formed in each um, stellar atmosphere. And then as they rotate around their common center of mass, uh, these uh, two absorption lines move. So um, in principle, the idea is really straightforward. If we want to find binaries containing white dwarfs, um, then what we want to do is we want to do the same thing, track the positions of their absorption lines. Indeed, white dwarfs have absorption lines in the upper layers of their atmospheres. The problem uh, is that uh, white dwarf absorption lines are very broad uh, due to something called Stark effect. Um, so I'm showing here on the top a regular stellar spectrum, kind of late AH type maybe, and then the white dwarf uh, spectrum on the bottom both show a series of hydrogen absorption lines, but you can see just by naked eye um, that the lines have very different shapes. So white dwarfs um, have um, line profiles that depend strongly on temperature and gravity. So you can, um, you know, there are atmospheric models that, uh, that can model the shape of these lines. Um, and indeed, you know, then we started thinking, so, okay, fine. Um, you know, uh, white dwarfs have extremely broad lines, maybe with a little bit of narrow core, if you add a little bit of noise, it kind of becomes a really, really difficult problem. But if we could model these lines with very high precision, maybe we can still tease out um, the effects of these binaries. So then what we discovered the moment we started working on this project is that a uh, vast majority of high quality atmospheric models that allow you to model these lines are proprietary. Um, there are two, three groups that are doing this and uh, they keep it <laughs> close to the rest. And so, um, you know, we were newcomers, we wanted to measure something and we found ourselves in a situation when we couldn't measure anything. Um, so we circumvented this problem using this uh, clever way of um, basically using uh, artificial neural networks to interpolate over a coarsely sampled grid of model atmospheres that were released 10 years ago. So somebody computed them, released them, for the use of the community, but they are kind of not super useful for fitting because they're on a very coarse grid of temperatures and gravities. And so um, this code allows you to very quickly interpolate between those models and produce a model of any temperature and gravity as long as it's sort of within the bounds of the initial grid. And so, um, 
Uh, on the left here, I'm showing a typical theoretical modeling of weight dwarf atmosphere paper uh, with H alpha, H beta, H gamma stepped up. And the, so this shows the data and the models superposed and the best fits. And this is our method. So these guys are fitting actual physically motivated models that compute um, Stark effects and radiative transfer of various kinds and very, very, very complicated things. We don't know any of this physics, or rather our code does not know any of this physics. It just interpolates over this grid of parameters in a very clever way and uh, produces, uh, produces the results that um, are quite similar. So the pros of this method is it's very fast, actually. Once you train your model, the fitting itself is much faster than trying to use the physically motivated uh, models. It's public. You can go and try to fit your favorite DA uh, hydrogen atmosphere white dwarf. Um, we have tested it very extensively, and we recover parameters of white dwarfs with the same quality as uh, the guys who actually know what they're doing. Um, and the code can do much more. So if you feed new models to it or more complicated models or models with um, uh, additional physics and additional absorption lines, it will do better. So the cons are we are, we are limited by models and the public models that we had access to are uh, 10 years uh, old or more and the public grid is limited. So for example, uh, we have limitations on the low mass end and, and so on. So Vedant, um, who led this uh, effort, is actually collaborating with the groups who have uh, developed these atmospheric codes. So we're thinking about this, trying to find an acceptable solution going forward in Sloan. It's a complicated problem, um, but uh, we're thinking about it and working on it. Okay. Another way to measure white dwarf parameters is actually directly from Gaia photometry. Uh, I'm zooming in here on the piece of the color magnitude diagram from Gaia that covers white dwarfs. Um, the white dwarfs, uh, this is a nifty simulation made by Si Hao Cheng, who is a J2 graduate student also working in my, uh, on white dwarfs, but not in my group. Um, so the white dwarfs um, kind of enter from the hot blue end and then cool along these uh, blue lines. And um, so you can see the lines of kind of constant age uh, going from bottom left to top right. Um, and then at a fixed age, uh, the brighter ones that are on top are lower mass because remember what white dwarfs, the more massive white dwarfs are more compact and the less massive white dwarfs are bigger. And so you kind of have, it takes a little bit of an adjustment. But anyways, the bottom line is that the, the um, this direction is the direction in decreasing mass from bottom left to top right. Okay, so now we can measure things. And uh, so on the left, you see, was, was, let's measure something. So here on the X axis, I am showing photometric radius. So this is from photometry and the luminosity of the white dwarf roughly is a black body with some opacity effects. So once you know the temperature from the colors, you can get the surface area and therefore the radius. So that's the radius. That's the and the uh, distance as well. Uh, yes, well, for the Gaia, you are in this beautiful new era where distances are known, which is a completely different ball game from ever before, right? So, um, um, and on the y axis, I am just showing the net Doppler shift, and it can be calculated in a variety of ways using our models or even simpler models. Okay, so the first thing um, to notice is that there's this like big lump. So the big lump in the center, that's nothing alarming. Um, that's just a peak in the white dwarf mass uh, distribution because a lot of relatively low mass stars evolved into white dwarfs of those masses. So they kind of get there into this blob. Uh, but the second thing to notice is that this is the line of zero net redshift and all of them are redshifted. So what are we like in some bubble in which white dwarfs are running away from us? So no. This is the, uh, there's a systematic redshift associated with the um, uh, gravitational redshift as the photons are climbing out of the gravitational potential of the white dwarf. So this is uh, proportional to M and inversely proportional to R. So it gives you a handle on the uh, mass radius relationship. So uh, we carefully remove any bulk motions in the galaxy. We measure in the bins of mass and we produce this plot. So this is a gravitational redshift 
um, as a function, again, of the photometric radius, which can also be read as mass. And so this is really the first time that the gravitational redshift from white dwarfs has been measured across such a wide range of masses. Um, I want to emphasize that there are three independent things that can be measured for this population. The gravitational redshift from the spectrum, which is what was new in this work. Um, then the surface gravity from atmospheric models that I just described, and the radius from the total flux. So previous papers have extensively made sure that these two measurements are in agreement with one another, but so the gravitational redshift is new. And uh, we want two things, mass and radius. So this is an over-constrained problem and we can have a zillion and one checks and uh, making sure that everything works well. So everything works well. Um, so this method allows us to measure the empirical mass radius relationship across all masses and uh, measure average gravitational redshift across all masses. So the, the bulk uh, motion, how do you know that you can remove it accurately enough? Okay, so again, checks and balances. So, um, uh, so in the bulk motion, so for example, you know, we worried a little bit about, so, so first of all, we um, assume a certain model for the local standard, uh, for the motion of the sun relative to the local standard of rest. And we try several different ones and make sure that the results don't depend on what we assume about how the sun is moving relative to the local standard of rest. So that was number one. Number two was, Let's split the sky into one hemisphere and another hemisphere and make sure we get consistent results from both. That is actually interesting because if you look forward in the direction of solar motion and backward, you might be able to see asymmetric drift because white dwarfs are partially velocity dispersion supported populations, so they should be lagging a little bit. And we see that, and it's in agreement with what we expect from the velocity dispersion of the population. Um, so there, uh, you know, so we have done all kinds of different things to assure ourselves that, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is all uh, working very well. And each bin here contains, so the total number of objects that went into this, I want to say is about 3,000. Um, and of course, you know, you see the error bars here, that is because there are fewer objects at the extreme ends of the mass distribution. Um, and you know, over 500 objects uh, kind of go in, into each one uh, of those bins. Okay, and apologies, I think I have a chat. Um, Elliot, yeah. Hi, Nadia. I'm curious, the, the radius depends on the mean molecular weight of electrons, so on the composition. Do you think that's something that's possible to measure? I'm getting to this on the next slide. Thank you so much for this question. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, the models that you're seeing here, so, so I want to draw your eye to the red model for now. The red model is basically pure uh, electron degeneracy model. Um, and the blue line is the, if you add a little bit of temperature, so you'll add a little bit of thermal energy, a little bit of thermal pressure, it lifts the degeneracy a little bit and the white dwarfs at a given mass become puffier. That's what, that, those are the difference between um, red and blue lines. So the deviations from the small final details of this are scientifically very interesting and we're thinking about this. And so there are two different things that we're trying to do. So one is to measure this temperature dependence. And I know that uh, we can do this with Sloan 5 because Vedant has probably already done this. Um, so tentatively we have a measurement and we just need to uh, polish it and make it presentable. Um, but another interesting thing is the one that Elliot is asking about. So if you zoom in to the sort of high mass end here uh, of this plot, you will see that there is this orange line and the orange line is the oxygen neon cores uh, as opposed to carbon oxygen cores, which is the rest of the models shown here. And this is a very interesting problem in um, the evolution of massive stars. It's unresolved. It's an unresolved issue as far as I can understand as a kind of newcomer in this field, whether or not these oxygen neon cores form, and if so, under what circumstances, and if so, at kind of what masses. And so it may be possible. So the difference here is about actually, you know, seven to 10 kilometers per second in terms of gravitational redshift. So this is not crazy. The way we want to do this is we don't want to, you know, there, 
there's not going to be enough objects for us to average down to this precision. There is another technique that we're trying to do, and that is in white binary stars. If you have a main sequence companion, um, you know the net radial velocity of the binary, and you can measure the uh, gravitational redshift of the white dwarf companion by comparing uh, the radial velocities of the two. So we have some programs, um, some data sets, um, on Gemini, we're also thinking about, you know, pushing to do this with Sloan. Um, it's very difficult. That's a little bit of a pie in the sky. The temperature thing we will measure. We may have already measured. Okay, so that's my answer to uh, Elliot's question. We're excited about this, but I don't know if we can if we can do this. Um, all right, so I want to spend the rest of the presentation talking about whiteboard binaries and modern surveys. This is what kind of excited me first about this project. That's why we developed all this machinery for. So there are three possible ways to look for white dwarf uh, binaries. We can look for single line binaries when you can only see the brighter object that is wobbling back and forth due to, to an unseen companion. You can look for the double line binaries where you, you see both. And then potentially another interesting technique is you can look for DV if you have a really, really good model for the spectrum um, and you have Doppler blurring of the lines or whatever, potentially you can see, uh, look for deviations um, from the predictions from photometry and spectroscopy. I mean, they should appear a little brighter if they're binaries compared to single ones and so on. So there's, they're interesting, uh, but there's interesting potential there. So let's take a look at this object. Um, this is a white dwarf. I'm, I'm highlighting H alpha and H beta, and we are now uh, showing the 15 minute exposures from Sloan. So these are consecutive 15 minute exposures totaling one hour. Okay, so you can see that the shapes are change, changing here. You know, maybe this is double baked, maybe this is single baked. So, how do we know if this is noise or if this is real? So, it turns out that this is real. Um, and this is a discovery paper of a 99-minute uh, double-lined white binary from Sloan 5. This was actually the first ever science paper from the Sloan 5 survey. Um, we did this by uh, observing this object with Gemini, and now we are, we, because of the larger collecting area, we can do this in five-minute chunks. So what's being shown here, this is the velocity direction, and this is time on the vertical axis. So each stripe is a spectroscopic exposure, and the yellow stuff is showing you where the absorption lines are. And so you can see that the absorption lines are doing this exact same thing that you're expecting them to do. Um, there are a couple of gaps here in the data, which we account for in our timing model of the source. Um, so this is, a, this is an extremely over-constrained system. It's a double-line binary. Each component can be fitted with atmospheric models. They have different gravitational redshifts. So that can also give you an additional constraint. And we have photometry. So I'm showing you some of the constraints that we have on this object. So the orbital solution for this object is fully constrained and the inclination is known to within several degrees. So it's a really good fit. So now what I really want to tell you about is where, yes. I was just going to ask, where are the typical distances of these? Excellent questions. So this one is at 110 parsecs. Um, so what the remarkable thing about this whole project to me is that we are still discovering objects within several tens of parsecs from us. The survey of white dwarf binaries within 100 parsecs is not complete. And this is part of what I'm going to be telling you in just a moment. Um, and Sloan will be sensitive to, you know, maybe two, three hundred parsecs, but not much more than that. What are the masses of the two objects? In the so this is what's being shown here. These are all of the double-lined white dwarf, white dwarf binaries known as of 2021. Uh, this is the orbital period. And I want to remind you that things that under 10 hours are the ones that will merge in the Hubble time. And these are the stellar masses. And the reason that this plot is showing um, double line binaries is that in these cases, the order can be fully solved and you know both objects. And so the, the, so each, you know, each, each one is two dots connected by this vertical line. Okay, so our object is this one. So 0.5 and 0.3. So the total 0.8 solar masses I'm getting to whether that's interesting and what's important um, here. Um, and so uh, what I want to kind of spend some time on is 
what are we expecting uh, next from Sloan and from other modern surveys? What are the other sources on this diagram and why they're interesting? Okay, so um, with Sloan, we're gonna be sensitive in this regime. Uh, we actually have about a dozen interesting candidates from the first nine months of Sloan 5 data that we're following up now with Gemini and Magellan. I actually asked to reschedule this talk for a few months down the line, hoping I'll show you some candidates, but that's fine. So um, uh, that's what I'm working on this year. Uh, Nadia, just to clarify, these are detached binaries? Yes. Uh, well, so these are far enough away that... So, I am getting there. Yes. So let me tell you about these super exciting sources that are under one hour. So these are all coming from Burge et al. 2021. So there's a super short period. And remember what I told you about how the gravitational wave emission is an accelerating function of uh, orbital separation. So the shorter the order, the separation, the less time they spend there. So it's actually very unexpected to see objects in this part of the diagram, or rather you have to probe a much bigger volume of the galaxy to find them because they spend so little time there. So indeed, these objects are much more distant. These ones are at one, two kiloparsecs. Um, these are selected from about 10 million DTF light curves. Then they run them through various periodogram analysis and they flag about 25,000 of uh, periodic candidates and then they visually examine them, which reminds me of my first ever project in graduate school uh, very strongly. Um, so they have identified about 300 um, candidates that they're following up with radial velocities and so on. So let me show you this guy. Um, that is a seven minute, uh, so that's answering that question. That's a seven minute uh, uh, binary, which um, has eclipses and ellipsoidal mod uh, modulation. And uh, there is a detectable orbital decay in the 10 years uh, of uh, uh, photometric data. So this is a movie from Burge uh, that is just showing how the light, the various features of the light curve um, arise as the two objects orbit each other. So this is the shortest period known, right? And so that's kind of the level of the ellipsoidal modulations that you see um, in, in, um, uh, in these sources. Okay, so very exciting, uh, very exciting stuff. Okay, what are these things? Okay, so this is, an, uh, uh, this is a collection of uh, 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 double line binaries from a variety of pre SDSS5 spectroscopic campaigns. This is a little bit misleading because there is basically about an order of magnitude more of single line binaries where you only see one line. The problem with these objects is that you only get, you know, you, you can measure the mass function and you can get the lower limit on the mass of the companion, which is why they're not shown on this plot. But you should keep in mind that these are not the only, the, not the only white work, white work binaries known. There's also this other single line population. Um, okay, so there have been several interesting surveys. Uh, one of these interesting surveys is by Warren Brown et al. over many years. Um, they targeted about 100 uh, bright, meaning low mass white dwarfs. Um, and the low mass here is less than 0.4 solar masses. And that is interesting because there's not enough of a Hubble time for low mass stars to have evolved into white dwarfs. And therefore, the basic stellar evolution theory predicts they should all be in binaries. And indeed, Warren Brown confirms they are all in binaries. Uh, what's interesting about them is that they are they form this bimodal distribution in the period mass uh, space. So this is the visible, fluffier, bigger object with a invisible higher mass companion, again, because of this funny relationship because it's between mass and radius. Modern stellar population synthesis models actually reproduce this bimodality. Um, and um, the, you know, when you see something like this, as an astronomer, you always say, oh, there are two channels of formation of these sources. And so indeed, there are two different channels of formation of these sources. The prediction of stellar binary population models um, is that these uh, most compact ones that will have merged during the couple time go through two common envelope phases. Um, so that's 
where a lot of uncertainty um, in the stellar population synthesis models um, lie. And so the typical, these, these uh, similar, this, it's not the same model that produced this plot um, above, but similar types of stellar population synthesis models predict this distribution of white dwarf, white dwarf binaries within 100 parsecs. Okay, and so here we are sort of um, currently discovering still objects at the low mass end of this population. And with Sloan, we're gonna be sensitive um, you know, here in this regime. So our hope is definitely that we're gonna start discovering the more massive, uh, more massive kind of analogs uh, of what is known so far. And it is true that the stellar population synthesis models predict that there should be more low mass ones than the high mass ones. So it is essential to measure the mass distribution of these binaries here in this regime. Okay, so even within a hundred parsecs, you know, this that we are still kind of just kind of skimming the tip of the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Another extremely exciting question is what happens when these uh, objects have shrunk down to a equal to zero due to gravitational wave emission. So, um, and that's kind of like part of the motivation for us to try to discover more of these sources. So I, um, there's a huge amount of literature here. I will focus on just three different possible pathways. One possibility is that, uh, let's say our binary, which is 0 0.4, 0, 0 0.5 and 0.3, it merges. And one possibility is just that produces a massive white dwarf, a, mass, a new massive white dwarf. Um, there's lots of interesting observational phenomenology. There are candidate objects that uh, people speculate have just recently emerged um, and produced uh, a massive white dwarf. In terms of the population um, synthesis, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And depending on which paper you read and which mass you look at, people speculate that 10 to 100 percent of massive white dwarfs are merger products. This top plot here is one of the first um, uh, Gaia papers on white dwarfs. This is kind of like the most extreme view. Um, so these authors, Kilich et al, uh, uh, show the mass distribution of Gaia white dwarfs, and they demonstrate that it has these two peaks, and they show that the, so the, with the blue line, they are showing the predictions from a constant star formation model, and they're basically saying, oh, look, there's this awesome big peak at 0.8, uh, aren't they all mergers of these low mass white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. So other people said, uh, wait, not so fast. Um, there are interesting uh, kind of features in the initial to final uh, mass function for massive stars. Um, so this feature might well be explained by the fact that stars naturally kind of produce uh, white dwarfs at these masses. So again, this is, this is a very active area of research, but um, people are looking for high mass, high rotation rate, high magnetic field, high kinematic ages, signatures of, um, uh, of merger signatures in the white dwarf population. Another interesting possibility is that two white dwarfs um, can merge producing a super Chandrasekhar object, which then gradually cools, loses support and either explodes or implodes. There is a really interesting candidate object discovered by Guerra Madza et al. Um, 2019. They use models from um, Schwab and Elliot Quarteret and Dan Kazin to estimate a 1.5 solar mass for this object. But the fate of that object is very much unknown. So it's in a nebula, it's producing very powerful winds, very exciting object. I want to focus on this possibility number three is whether the these binaries, once they merge, can explode in the sub chandrasekhar regime. And so, of course, then it's very relevant uh, for the origin of type 1a supernovae. There's been a lot of new developments in this area in the last five years, and I am particularly excited by the series of papers on double detonation models by uh, various combination of Ken Shen and Dean Townsley and Samuel Booth. 
Um, this is a, a movie from um, Dean and uh, from Boos and, and Townsley. So the idea here is that you have a carbon oxygen core and you have a narrow layer of helium atmosphere and you detonate the helium uh, layer and there's a shock wave kind of propagating along the isodensity contour here. And then once the shock waves converge, um, they manage to penetrate the guts of the star and uh, detonate the carbon oxygen core. What is truly remarkable about uh, these models, is, and that is really new as of the last several years. So these models are actually not new. This idea was first proposed over 10 years ago. But what is new is that they are getting very good at matching observations. So in particular, this is a figure from Shen et al. 2021. The gray dots here are the Phillips relations. So these are the bright, the, the um, brighter, slower supernovae are here, and fainter, faster supernovae are here. And so uh, superimposed on them and are these color, um, color labels. 0.85 solar mass, 0.9, 1, and 1.1. So those are well under sub, sub well sub Chandrasekhar white dwarfs that are producing relevant nickel yields in order to explain the observed duration and the brightness of the supernovae. And the models naturally explain the Phillips relation as a mass sequence. So nickel produces both the emission due to radioactive decay and the, opacity, the bulk of opacity, um, especially during early times. And so that naturally puts these models on this Y relationship. So I tried to dig into this a little bit. I'm completely new to this field. It was, you know, I learned on my mother's knee that, uh, you know, type 1As are produced by Chandrasekhar reaching white dwarfs. And so now all of a sudden we're exploding things that are significantly less massive. Um, so what has changed in the last five years? As far as I can see, um, there is um, there are improvements in the treatment of the nuclear reaction network. So they can explode things with a much thinner helium layer than before and thick helium layer violated all kinds of observational constraints previously. And they also can do much better radiative transfer. And so now they can produce a very good match with late time, with late time spectra. It's not a solved problem. There are some remaining issues. There are some fine tuning questions about when exactly to detonate. Um, there are some orientation effects. Oops some orientation effects uh, uh, that go kind of perpendicular to the Phillips relation, but these models are getting better is the kind of bottom line of the message here. And so they're very, very promising. Um, in terms of rates, um, there is a, a, the, the rates, Okay, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here. So I'm just gonna try to say this briefly. So, um, Comparing the observed distributions of various binary populations and um, stellar population synthesis does have some issues. So there are discrepancies, for example, between uh, what Brown finds and what Lee finds for the exact same data set of these extremely low mass uh, white dwarfs on the sort of order of magnitude kind of level. Um, but there is a, uh, so remember that these stellar population synthesis contain this major black boxes like the common envelope evolution and various other uncertainties. So there is another way that is um, uh, much more phenomenological and observationally motivated, uh, pioneered by various combination of Badenis, Moss, and Halakun. They have a serious papers on this. The idea is the following. Um, even if you don't discover individual binaries, you can measure um, the maximal difference in radial velocity for any given object in a survey. Sloan has relatively low spectral resolution, so you can randomly produce, you know, up to 100 kilometer per second variation between, um, between different spectra, um, and that doesn't mean that it's in the binary, it's just the signal to noise effect. But there is this tail of the population with very high uh, velocity differences between exposures, and these are likely we're blinking. <laughs> These are likely uh, a, a double white dwarfs. So they take this population. Um, they take this population. They fit a phenomenological model to it um, uh, of some binary fraction and some distribution of semi-major axis at birth, and they conclude 
that the white dwarf merger rate is five uh, to seven times greater than type 1A rate. So even if just 15% of the binary white dwarf mergers result in type 1A supernovae, that's um, sufficient. That's a very interesting method that we are hoping to um, repeat once we have enough, um, enough uh, statistics from Sloan 5. Okay, so let me just briefly recap uh, the situation here. So uh, one thing that completely blew my mind away here is that type 1As could well be sub Chandrasekhar. In fact, I attended this um, conference on white dwarfs and sub Chandrasekhar models were the only models being discussed for type 1As, which is uh, when did everybody get the memo and why didn't I get it <laughs> anyway? So to, this was news to me. <laughs> sharing this with you. Um, so in principle, the observed double degenerate population is sufficient to explain uh, rates. Um, another thing that I haven't talked about is that this double detonation channel actually can produce a remnant of the donor. And these may have been discovered. And we dabbled in this and followed up on one of those donors. Um, and I can talk about that some other time. So um, this is not exactly a solved problem, but things are definitely converging. So my role in this, um, so Vedan Chanchi and I are uh, leading the search for double degenerates in SDSS-5. So our role in this is to get the better statistics for the higher mass, to discover higher mass systems in this regime between 0.5 and 10 hour periods. And um, of course, in the meanwhile, the, the stellar population synthesis uh, models need to be uh, improved sort of in agreement with different observables. And in the meanwhile, the theorists will be improving their understanding of how and why things explode in the sub chandrasekhar regime. Um, another extremely uh, interesting thing is that white dwarf binaries are very strong LISA sources. Um, this is a plot from us. Um, so this is the gravitational wave frequency. This is much lower gravitational wave frequency than LIGO. Um, so this is more, this is for LISA, which is a planned uh, mission to discover low frequency gravitational waves. And this is the um, strain with the curve showing the sort of four year sensitivity of LISA. And these are the currently known uh, double degenerate systems, including ours, that will be well above that sensitivity. What another thing that blew my mind away is the predictions from stellar population synthesis of what Lisa should see. So Lisa, Lisa will be able to see them in the local group, 40,000 individual white dwarf, um, white dwarf binaries, plus obviously, you know, a huge confused background of, uh, you know, many more sources below the individual sensitivity limit. And again, um, coming back to the previous question, we are right now at a few dozen, we're still discovering new objects within 100 parsecs. There was a discovery of a 26 parsec binary just a couple of years ago, uh, which is on, on those plots. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. So we are interested in stellar binaries of all stages, young stellar objects, main sequence binaries, entry into continental phases and ultra compact binaries of remnants. Um, I have told you about sort of the last uh, piece of this. Uh, we've been learning how to measure things um, and uh, how to measure white dwarf spectra, how to measure the equation of state. Um, and our goal here is to search for bi binary white dwarfs uh, where we have discovered one and we have a dozen in the works and hopefully more to come. So uh, it was a big surprise to me that uh, sub chandrasekhar uh, binaries might be uh, very important as possible type 1A progenitors. So I'm even more excited to, uh, to find them now. And uh, the future is very interesting because time variability astrophysics is uh, going to continue to be a big theme in the next uh, two decades. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions are all open, maybe to in the online and real life. Thanks for the talk. Uh, are there uh, super gender circuit binaries? Anyone, anyone discovered? So, um, okay. So for the confirmed double uh, lined binaries, the answer is no. 
there was an awesome, beautiful object published in, I want to say, 2015, 2016, which looked really promising. And then subsequent work obtained better quality spectra to discover contaminating emission lines that made them look split when they weren't, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so that went away. That was one object for the, for the double line. For the single line binaries, as I said, there's about 10 times more of those than of these. And the answer is that very likely, yes. Um, so we, we see only the lower limits on the companion masses. You know, you sort of think of some reasonable probability distribution for the orientations. Uh, very likely, yes. What's interesting is that the, um, uh, so this is anecdotal. I haven't actually seen the statistics plot. But what's interesting is that the more massive ones anecdotally are more, um, uh, are more separated, uh, meaning that they are not going to merge within the Hubble time. So they're like, you know, uh, a day long kind of period, um, you know, so, so there may be exceptions to this statement. Um, and then there are some binaries where the companion is almost certainly a uh, neutron star. So the, nominally speaking, the whole thing is <laughs> super Chandra Sekar, yeah. And so then it's an interesting question as to what happens when the white dwarf merges with a Newton star. Thanks. Yeah, Jeremy has a question. Yes, Nadia, fantastic talk. I, I, I wonder how the somewhat stodgy white dwarf community is receiving your, your invasion, but, but that's not my question. Um, for those very short period systems, when you can determine the mass and so forth, and the radius, um, are they consistent with a common cooling age? Uh, and so I'm thinking of systems that are quite close because, of course, I'm interested in tidal effects, but not so close that we would have mass transfer. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, I don't know the exact answer to the question uh, because um, uh, it's not actually that easy and always possible, even for a double degenerate system, to independently measure their spectroscopic parameters. Because remember, this is all mushed up and blended into this one big mess. So for our objects, we actually could have done that and should have done that. Um, but um, I don't know the answer to your question. But the other um, issue here is that I don't know if we necessarily expect them to be the same, right? Because they are. They, they did form at different times in this um, scenario. But it's an excellent question, and I, I, I don't know the answer to whether we can constrain it within. So, so we do have big errors uh, on the sort of temperature here. Um, and I don't know whether we can determine the cooling ages within, within those errors. But we will we'll take a look. Thank you. Michael, another question. Yeah, you, you said uh, you described that the number of um, merge, uh, the predicted number of merging white dwarfs is five or seven times more than the number that you need. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, that is, can you predict what fraction of these merging, can the theorists tell us what fraction of the merging uh, white dwarfs may actually explode as supernovae? It's a reasonable thing, meaning that uh, they also can make a statement as to what fraction of the current white dwarfs have resulted from mergers, and it's a sane fraction. Um, okay. Again, it's a mass dependent uh, number. So, so far, the statement does not contradict anything. Unfortunately, given their model, they cannot, uh, uh, they don't have enough sensitivity. This is a very simple model that doesn't have enough sensitivity to the masses uh, within that. So you need the stellar population synthesis models to tell you what the mass distribution is, which is fine if I trusted them, but I'm not sure I do. And we haven't measured this yet. So once we actually, so on this exact plot, uh, what I'm talking about is, you know, we're kind of like in this regime now, but once we have, you know, an order of magnitude increase in the objects here, we are hope, whoops, we can actually hope to measure this mass distribution. Then this is exactly the question that we should be able to answer. So, Nani, you said a few times that the, the common end of evolution is a black box. Why is it a black box? Why is it, so, what, what is the real challenge there? Um, so, I have 
Okay. So first of all, in the stellar population synthesis, they are the the whole this whole process is described by two parameters. So there is this alpha parameter, which is the uh, fraction of binding energy that uh, goes into the ejection of the envelope. And then there's a lambda parameter, <laughs> which is uh, sort of like the fudge factor to describe the binding energy of the envelope. So that's the, uh, uh, th these two models shown actually differ in the, in the set of alphas and lambdas that they choose. So now I want to know more about the hydrodynamic and MHD simulations of this process, and there are such things. So I, not being a specialist, I don't know whether, you know, what the issue is. My guess is that the high dynamic range of things involved. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about ejecting the super diffuse envelope of the red giant. So if the objects, merge before they enter the red giant phase, the most likely outcome is that they will merge because there will not be enough energy to couple to the envelope to eject it. The envelope is still very much in the deep potential well here. Um, and so now in order to really model the, um, um, the process, you're dealing with these two very compact cores at very small distances with this giant, very diffuse, uh, envelope that is, I guess, convective and, you know, I'm guessing that's where the diff difficulties are. But there are model hydro models that, you know, they're pretty movies that I could have shown um, to try to do this and I want to know more about it. Hello? Yes, hi Nadia. Um, one of the things that came out of the Mao's and, and Badna's statistical constraints on mergers was a constraint on the super Chandrasekhar merger rate. So I wonder if you can comment on how much better that will be done using Sloan 5, specifically for the super Chandrasekhar part of the distribution. Uh, okay, so I mean, this is where I kind of don't know all of the details uh, because I don't actually know what they said about the super change sector constraint, but I can comment on what we are expecting from Sloan 5, and that is a um, sort of a, an order of magnitude improvement in the number, um, in the number of objects. So we just started here, right? So we just we want to repeat this measurement from uh, Meaz and Badenis at all for Sloan 5. Um, I have not yet developed kind of that feeling for how the accuracy on their derived merger rates depends on what we actually observe from the Delta RV distribution yet, because we haven't done this yet. You know, we just started thinking about it, you know, two yeah. months ago. Sorry. No, no, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, do you happen to know what's roughly the signal to noise for the you know two hour uh, Sloan source um, that you talked about um, for Lisa during the Lisa mission? So um, is it just barely detectable, or is it? Um, so here we are. It, actually, I can see. Um, so it is a few. So so this is the four year. Okay, can we see this? This is the four year sensitivity line. Um, this is a, you know, a factor of a few kind of at this frequency about the sensitivity line. I mean, there are, what is kind of mind boggling to me is that these objects, the ones that are on the extreme end of the high signal to noise distribution, one of these sources was just discovered last year. You know, so we are clearly not yet in, in control of this population. Um, so there will be, you know, there, our source is not particularly impressive in this domain because it's 113 parsecs, but there will be interesting, exciting sources that are a few tens of parsecs away that will just, you know, be um, completely crazy here. I think the points on, on that side, those are the shorter period sources, right? Uh, so this is, yes, higher frequency, shorter period, a little bit closer, and all of those contribute to their high signal to noise, yeah. Uh, uh, for the double detonation scenario, like uh, uh, 
like are there any simulations which predict uh, differences from the Phillips right curve that you were mentioning or would they, would this impact like uh, cosmological ladder um so the uh, this is a great question and many a conference has been spent sort of debating this question uh, the um current um state of the so the two things I want to say. So first of all, the uh, Phillips relation um, calibration is currently completely empirical. So there's no theory that go right now as of the last 30 years. The way that they have done this is that they have not relied on any of these models in any way. There has been long a suspicion that the Phillips relation is a sequence of mass. Um, that has been suspected for a long time or desired for a long time because there were natural physical reasons to, um, to expect this. But they have never used any simulations or any theoretical models to calibrate the relationship. And so what they do is they, um, uh, they uh, have some fitting functions, empirically determined fitting functions to um, reduce the scatter in these light curves. Now, what is potentially impactful to cosmology is that if any of this stuff depends in important ways on metallicities, um, then as a function of environment in different galaxies probed at different redshifts, you could potentially get a slightly different Phillips relationship in high redshift galaxies and in low redshift galaxies. And there's a hundred hundreds of papers uh, written about that and possible effects um, um, that, that that can have. Um, so there are definitely environmental correlations and effects that are known um, and that are not well understood. I, I mean, I was asking more on the point of like, there could be like two populations in the Phillips relation and one of the populations could be this double lesion, like double detonation scenarios. And so maybe you could like even tighten the error bars. Uh, so um, it is possible, okay. So yes, yeah, so if, um, right, possible multiple populations within this. So um, that's also a question about rates. Is the double detonation scenario alone sufficient to explain all of the type 1As, right? Like if this is the way that they explode. So the answer is this is one of the areas where things disagree right now. So they predicted between 15 and 30 double degenerate remnants uh, remnant donors within I, a couple of kiloparsecs or something, and they have discovered three. Okay, so there's about an order of magnitude discrepancy right now, but there are all kinds of weird uh, selection effects that go into this. So we don't know whether the double the double detonation um, scenario is the leading one or a subdominant one, one of the many or the one. So that's kind of where we are right now. That's a very, you know, a very exciting question. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, I want to ask one more question on the fate of most of these mergers. Yes. So yes. most of them do not generate type one, and so they are they they become white dwarfs, right? Yes. So um, uh, these remnants, uh, they have distinct spectral features, right? and they have to probably fast proper speed, uh, depending on what exactly happened. During the merger, where you know nuclear burning might eject mass and then leave them at some high proper speed, so what are the what are the expectations and how how you're gonna how you find these because uh, they are there are there is a good number of them. So if you wait long enough, then they just settle into your normal white yeah. dwarf situation, <laughs> right? So uh, for the brief period in time, they are indeed very special. And so the predictions for what they look like during these brief periods in time, so, you know, theorists kind of, uh, so, so again, I, I know a little bit about the phenomenology of those things. There are these are Corona Borealis objects uh, that look very weird that people speculate might be the sort of recent results, um, results of the merger. The one that, would, that what I specifically mentioned here, um, uh, the Guaramadze et al. 2019 object was very, very special because it was producing extremely high velocity outflows and intermediate metallicity, uh, intermediate uh, atomic number elements um, that looked very, very peculiar. And, um, you know, that's how they sort of identified that um, as a recent uh, recent merger candidate. So um, the problem is that these are short-lived phases. 
So um, we're talking about, you know, 100,000 years for, for some of those. And um, uh, the, so, so yes, yeah, so, so you start with a population that's intrinsically faint, that you can only probe within a few hundred parsecs, and you cut it down so much by the sort of duty cycle where they're only visible as weird for just a few hundred thousand, you know, years. And, you know, you end up with a very small number. So what people do instead is they try to isolate the parts of the mass function where the mergers may be more common using kind of these types of, uh, uh, these type of uh, selection criteria. Okay. Um, you just mentioned that there could be different pathways to detonation with double detonation or single detonation. How does that work also with the like standardizable candle thing? Sorry, how does it work also with what? The fact that the supernova 1A are standardizable candles kind of. So I. Um, it should be one path. That's right. Yeah, so um, again, right now, the observational situation is on this plot. Actually, let me show you something that I don't know much about, but that was a very important, uh, beautiful plot. So type 1 A's are not the only type of thermonuclear explosion. <laughs> so there's like a whole zoo out here and uh, different types of things can evolve to different types of uh, types of supernovae. So the Phillips relation is here in the, so this is from a really nice review paper by Jadal. This is the Phillips relation here, but um, uh, uh, super Chandrasekhar, near Chandrasekhar explosions can actually happen in different parts of this diagram. So I've heard uh, these type 1 AXs that could be super Chandrasekhar, but are not complete detonation. And then the super luminous ones over here could be super Chandrasekhar. Um, anyway, so, so there's all kinds of stuff that I don't know anything about. Um, uh, and people are very actively uh, researching. So the question that Jay asked was whether or not the double detonation could be the leading channel, in which case this is one and only sequence produced by one and only scenario. So the answer to this is we don't know, and there is a discrepancy as of now. There are not enough of the remnants found in order to for that to be the dominant scenario, but that may well change um, if people find more or if people find additional way uh, additional kind of manifestations of, could we have some notion of what the donor might look like? It is a weird puppy white dwarf and th that's what they were looking for and that's what they found. But what if it looks a little bit different from these expectations, we may have missed it, you know, that's the sort of like, yeah. So that's where we are with, with that, so. Mm -hmm. All right, we it's already 12.15, we'll reconvene over the buckle line at 12.30. And well, let's thank our speaker.